It is good to be gathered here with you in his name this morning. And thank you, Pastor Rod, for this opportunity to share God's word with you all. When Pastor Rod first asked me to share my life's verse, I was conflicted on two points. First, I was hesitant to stand behind the sacred desk. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit reminded me of Apollos in the early church who followed Paul wherever he went. Paul was ordained to lead. Apollos was called to follow. Pastor Rod is ordained to lead this church. I am called to follow that man right there. So I'm okay with this this morning. <laughs> Secondly, how could I pick one life's verse? I mean, come on, really? If you truly follow Jesus, you will have many life's verses. Amen? Amen. As I pondered this second point, however, which verse to share, the Holy Spirit whispered to me, share the verse that changed your life forever. So I said, okay, God. So here we go. As Pastor Rod has recently taught us in his sermon series, Family Farm, life is full of planting or sowing and reaping. My life's verse I share with you today is found in John 12, 24. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So remember this. The sowing or the planting of good seed into good soil is the greatest miracle God has ever given his children. I was raised in church. In fact, I was born and raised in this church. Both of my parents, Walter and Loretta Rupel, were wonderful Christians. My parents both came from homes that had suffered from divorce due to the generational sins of alcoholism and unfaithfulness. However, both of my parents accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior at an early age, and then they found each other. And being childhood sweethearts, they were married in the Old Rock Church at 22nd and Franklin Streets. One of my parents' uh, spiritual resolutions was to raise their family in the fear and admonition of the Lord. This meant you were in church every time the doors were open. <laughs> Literally. Hebrews 10, 24, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. So we didn't. <laughs> this was non-negotiable. And if you were really sick, after prayer, you laid in bed on Sunday morning no TV and no reading the funny papers out of the newspaper. <laughs> now, with our parents being Pentecostal and my dad being in the military, you can imagine how strict our religious upbringing could be. Church was always a dress-up occasion. Always. Now, please don't get me wrong. There are too many wonderful memories to recount in growing up in our family. My parents loved Jesus, they loved our family, they loved this church, and they loved having fun. Amen. My dad was the spiritual hinge pin in my life, as he was for most everybody in our family, both immediate and extended. My dad was the one who led me to accept Jesus as my savior. It was on a Sunday night and I was eight years old. I remember it as if it were yesterday. I remember the prayer, the tears, my dad's arm around me, and his pearly white handkerchief. I'll never forget it. However, just one year later, at the age of nine, I was introduced to pornography by an extended family member. One of my grandmothers once said, honey, in our family, you're either Pentecostal or you're heathen. With a, with a little sprinkling of Baptist and Methodist in between. <laughs> I remember the guilt of that night and the shame that I felt. I never told my parents about that experience to this day. And there are a few who knew that ever happened. Little did I know that one generational sin would be the first of many 
planted in my life which would bear fruit of devastating consequences in my later years. Now, depending upon who you talk to, my growing up years varied from being somewhat mischievous I really thought I'd burned all those pictures. <laughs> Y'all forgive me, I was having a bad hair day. <laughs> My growing up years varied from being somewhat mischievous to a downright dirty, rotten scoundrel. Like I said, opinions varied. I grew up doing the church thing. I learned about God, the things of God, what a Christian should walk, talk, and look like. But I replaced my personal relationship with Jesus by doing the church thing instead. I compartmentalized my life with Jesus just being another part of my life. In this way, I kept control of my life's choices so I could call the shots and do what I wanted, feeling satisfied that everything was all right between me and God. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, there are two kinds of repentance. There is a worldly sorrow or repentance that works death, and then there is a godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is the kind that is sorry for the consequences of bad choices, the pain and suffering that a person or their family must suffer as a, a result of those bad choices. But it only lasts as long as there are consequences. A godly sorrow is true repentance that sees sin as God sees it. A true repentance turns away from sin and turns towards God and begins to actively seek the life that only Jesus Christ can provide. Now there was always a constant intervention in my life. Moments of clarity and conviction by the Holy Spirit too many revivals to recount and summer church camps along with Sunday night services where the Holy Spirit would move in powerful ways, constantly wooing me to surrender my heart and life to Jesus. But my repentance was always worldly and short-lived. So at an early age began the struggle between the man that I was becoming and the man God wanted me to be. In pursuit of a future, I began to contemplate a vocation and someone to share my life with. God in his providence sent me a wonderful Christian woman, my wife Marisa. I considered Marisa my Puerto Rican beauty. <laughs> she had so many endearing ways that I felt she was just the woman I needed. Little did I realize that Jesus saw her in the same way. For she would end up being my life support during some of the darkest days of my life. Then starting a career with the railroad, I felt my life was set. However, I didn't realize the conflict of having two loves in my life. For I was to become a severe workaholic. But we settled into marriage, purchasing a home and pursuing careers and planning for a family. After a few years, our first daughter, Aria, was born. Everyone was so excited, especially my dad, because Aria was his first granddaughter. She was the last grandchild my dad would ever see born. He died suddenly from a massive heart attack at the age of 49 years old, just over a little year later. It says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, everyone is building a house, either on the rock or on the shifting sand. To have a solid foundation, you must build on a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything else is shifting sand, which can and will crumble. For Jesus said, when the storms of life come, not if, when. Every person will and does experience storms in their life. 
The key to this passage is to do the words of Jesus. When my dad died suddenly, the storm in my life was at hurricane force, and part of my foundation was swept away. Although my dad was and is the greatest Christian man I have ever personally known, I had mistakenly made him part of my foundation, or part of my spiritual identity, if you will. I was depending on his testimony, his faith, his walk with the Lord. I was depending on my dad, not Jesus. As a result, my world was thrown into chaos. Being the oldest child, I felt the responsibility of being the strong one, but I had nothing. I was spiritually bankrupt. There were so many life questions left unanswered that I became confused, overwhelmed, and inept. Despair set in, turning into a deep depression, which lasted for years. I developed a fear of dying at this time. I foolishly turned to the failure of my own strength. The generational sins that had been planted in my early years of growing up began to sprout. The habits that I had flirted with as a teenager began to take root. This led to occasional drinking with friends after work, among other things. Again, because I had compartmentalized my life and my relationship with Jesus, I could justify such choices. I continued the facade of doing the church thing. Life went on fast. Our daughters, Lindsay and Amy, were born two years apart shortly after my dad's death. My career took off and we were constantly moving for a while. I began to lose the battle with my habits. My life was quickly spinning out of control. In Ephesians 5.12, the Apostle Paul says it is shameful to even talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. In Proverbs, King Solomon says, to leave the path of wisdom is to take the corkscrew path to death and hell. With that being said, it will suffice to say that the next 13 plus years of my life were full of addictions, darkness, and despair. I had become a full-blown closet alcoholic with other life-controlling issues. About this time, a chain of events began to happen that looking back, I realized were God's hand in my life. Marisa gave birth to our fourth daughter, Amanda Suzanne. She was born with a genetic disorder called Smith-McGinnis syndrome, a developmental delay. She was mentally challenged with many physical challenges as well. It was also revealed that I was drinking on my job. So my friends at work did an intervention and I entered into rehab. I also began to have a series of heart attacks. Imagine that. In my rehab, I came clean with Marisa, my family, and the company I worked with. At this point, I saw no way out, and I experienced what we call and celebrate recovery, hitting your absolute rock bottom. But in that moment, I truly turned to Jesus, giving my heart to him. I determined no matter what happened, I would follow Christ. The struggle to fully surrender to Jesus and fight with my addictions seemed insurmountable at times. A friend once said I was like Lazarus when Jesus called him back from the dead. I was alive, but I was still wearing the grave clothes of my past, which had the stench of death on them. It was during this time our fifth daughter, Christina, was born. <laughs> Life continued at racetrack speed, can I just tell you. I was struggling to reestablish trust with Marisa and my family. Then in the midst of all of this, after several years, the unthinkable happened. Our daughter Amanda somehow got out of the house and undetected, 
fell into our swimming pool and drowned. The numbness of grief and the whirlwind of her funeral service was something I had felt before my dad's death. However, the Holy Spirit this time was ever present. There were times when it felt like I could tangibly feel the Holy Spirit's presence in my life. But it was here that God delivered me from a fear of dying that had plagued me since my dad's death years before. I and my family struggled on trying to somehow go forward, grasping the reality of our loss. On the second anniversary of Amanda's death, the Holy Spirit pressed me hard all day while at work to visit her grave that evening on my way home. I was reluctant because at this point, her death was still tender in my soul. But I went. As I stood there, praying and thanking God for his faithfulness, deep in my heart, I'm still asking the question, God, why? Why Amanda? It was in this moment that God spoke to me in my heart. He said, son, do you remember the scripture? Except a seed fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I mumbled, though. Yeah, Lord, it's, uh, it's in the gospel somewhere. <laughs> it's John 12, 24, the verse I've shared with you today. Then the Lord whispered something to me that shook me to the center of my soul. He said, son, I never intended for Amanda to live past the age of four years old. I planted her as a seed into the life of your family to keep your family together till I could get a hold of your heart. And when I knew that I had your heart, I brought her home to be with me in heaven. Suddenly, I saw God's hand of divine intervention in my life. For you see, my friends, it was on the very night that Marisa told me she was pregnant. I had planned to ask her for a divorce. I felt that I had gone too far. I had damaged my marriage, destroyed my family, jeopardized my career, and there was no more hope in me. I felt that her and the girls would be better off without me. But because of her pregnancy, I decided to stay until the baby was born. Then when Amanda was diagnosed and had all of her problems, I decided to stay a little longer. Psalms 25, 14 says, the secrets of the Lord are reserved for those who fear him. God then enumerated every situation and every circumstance since Amanda's birth and death that had kept me in my marriage. I was overwhelmed with God's mercy. As I dropped to my knees, I was crushed with the reality of my hard-heartedness. And I wept for the longest time. God then asked me two more questions and showed me other divine moves he had purposed in my family. I don't have time to share those with you here today, but I can tell you on that day, the anniversary of Amanda's death, the old Ron Rupel died. And the man who stands before you here today is not the same man that he was. You might ask, why would God do such a thing? How could a tragedy like that be part of his plan? But I ask you, why not? Our Heavenly Father sent His only begotten Son into this world as a seed to die that He might have a harvest of an innumerable throng of redeemed children. Our Heavenly Father knows and understands His immutable law of sowing and reaping better than anyone could ever imagine. 
Sometimes tragedy and crises are God's plan in our lives to loosen the soil so the rocks and the briars can be removed and he can create good soil ready for the seeds of righteousness. In closing, there's no way Pastor Rod could have known the significance of today in choosing me to speak this morning or the importance of you being here today. For you see, it was on this very day, July the 10th, 24 years ago, that my baby daughter, Amanda Suzanne, breathed her last and God took her home. And it was also on this very day, 22 years ago, in a graveyard, just a few miles up the road here, that Jesus met me at her graveside. I died that day. Jesus changed me forever. And I will never be the same. With every head bowed and every eye closed. This day has been orchestrated by God himself. And when I was praying about how to close this service, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what do you want? He spoke into my heart this one thing. I have not shared this today to incite your pity, but to show you the tender mercies of our ever-loving God. If there is a secret sin in your life today, God has handcrafted this service for you. For those of you that are watching online, you have not clicked in to this service by happenstance. You were meant to hear this story. If there is anything in your life out of your past, generational sins passed on by your family, bad choices as a, as a youth, things that you know God wants you to give up today for you are here by design. My God has been faithful. These 22 years, he has rid me of everything that had me bound out of my past. And what he did for me on this day, 22 years ago in a graveyard, he wants to do for you today. It doesn't matter what it is. I could sit up here and enumerate what you might be facing, but you already know. The Holy Spirit already has spoken to you. This is your moment. God has chosen today, this morning, for you to be set free from your past forever. So if that's you, if God has spoken to you about this morning and this service and what this message has told you in your heart, I want you to stand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It's very simple. We're turning this auditorium into an altar. We're going to pray. And our mighty God is going to work miracles in the lives of these who have responded. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for you have handcrafted this day. You have designed it to set people free. Jesus, thank you for the power of your blood. Holy Spirit, thank you for your power. You are the resurrection. And Lord, right now, I simply ask that you do for these, my friends, what you did for me 22 years ago. Lord, remove the shame and the guilt. Lord, for those that are online, Lord, go in, mend the tears in their spirits, the damage to their soul. God, heal their minds. Set them aright, Lord, and let them understand and know 
that it is not by chance that they are listening to this prayer even now, but that it is by your hand. Lord, I pray that you will set them free from every habit, every vice, all the guilt, all the shame, every sin, God, that has had them bound, that, Lord, they may run to you and embrace you just like you embraced me in that graveyard 22 years ago. Thank you, Lord, for your delivering power. Thank you for the power of your precious blood, for it cleanses us from all sin. And God, I thank you that starting today, today, you going forward with them, Lord, will continue to set them free through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit and your blessed word. Do for them what you've done for me, Lord, and we will give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. In the darkest days of the life of my family, my wife Marisa received three sure words of prophecy. They were from three different people at three different times, but they all said the same thing. The latter end will be greater than the beginning. These girls that are behind me are my daughters, and they are going to sing that song for you this morning. Take this song as a promise. Take it with you. Believe it and receive it and know that God has truly set you free.
Would you say thank you to Ronnie Rupel for sharing today? I have nothing to add. God bless you.